Sometimes his work was at least memorable, like this inflatable toy rabbit cast in stainless steel and turned into a parody of Brancusi's bird. He didn't make his own stuff, of course. No doubt Coons couldn't carve his name on a tree. He had European souvenir factories do that, creating delicious porcelain treasures to his design, like Michael Jackson with bubbles, and Leonardo's St. John. This little piggy went to market in a big way, for Kuhn sees himself as a spiritual artist. Accusing him of hype is like rebuking a fish for being wet. Hi, Jeff. A kitten in a giant sock. Tell me about it. Uh, this is one of my new, newer works that I'm uh, uh, creating. And I think that uh, it's a piece that's working in kind of a very classical tradition of uh, a crucifixion. And this is very open. It's uh, more fun-loving in a way, and uh, also deal with a spiritual theme. Well, I don't see much spirituality there yet. I see a very large and playful pussycat in a sock. But how are you going to inject spirituality into this image? I'm going to give the, the cat a little more Bambi-like eyelashes. Ah, very spiritual Bambi, yeah. And I think that the, the flowers are really quite uh, beautiful. They're very, very Baroque. I try to make works <clears throat> pardon me, that are very generous. I try to be as generous as I can be with myself. Uh, what do you mean and by generous? I mean, in what, you know, how is this more generous, say, than uh, uh, some other kind of sculpture? What's, what's generous about it? Well, I think that it's communicating uh, love. It's communicating uh, happiness. Uh, and it doesn't alienate anyone. I think that a young child could come in here, a five-year-old child, uh, could look and find some pleasure and some enjoyment, and I hope that it's something positive for humankind. Have you ever actually done any carving or modeling? Uh, no. 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 When I was uh, a child, I uh, did some uh, modeling. But what, with plasticine or modeling with plasticine. Oh. But now uh, we're working here in my New York studio, and I have a staff of artists that I work with, which are uh, really uh, quite phenomenal. So you think the stuff up, but you don't make it? Uh, that's correct. I have to oversee everything here, and I have oh. to make every decision. Otherwise, I'd have no relation to it at all. The 1980s may have been a low, dishonest time for much American art, but there were still serious artists around. And some of them continued to draw inspiration from the natural rather than the media environment. Susan Rothenberg lives on a horse ranch outside Santa Fe in New Mexico. Dotted around are the remains of ancient Indian pueblos. What's affecting me here very much is the color of this earth the color of the fragments, which tend to be red, black, and white. And I've got a lot more red in my palette than I ever had. And what's new here, and I don't know wh where I learned to believe this, but that yellow is the color of death. And a lot of yellow is coming into my work. Rothenberg came of age as an artist in the early 70s when minimalism still reigned. But she wanted a recognizable image and found it, rather unexpectedly, in horses. In the 70s, when you found yourself thinking about painting a horse, did the idea take you by surprise? Yes, I did, because I had an idea that I wanted to make a painting with figure and ground the same color. But I didn't know what image I would be using. And it couldn't be a human figure, because people just didn't do such a thing in the early 70s. So I needed something big and powerful to hook into. It was a vehicle for emotion and paint. In later paintings, the image of the horse is decomposed. It fragments. Then it gives way to abrupt signs for human figures and faces, bluntly pathetic, the result not so much of an idea as of a lump in the mind. They're signs for stress.
Rothenberg tries to strip feeling, anxiety most of all, down to basic signs, and yet her images have a dignity that comes from distance and restraint. They're not just emotional splurge. I was thinking about how Americans are known to want something new, and whether it's really true that we do, and whether my work is American. And I think in that I don't want to ever continue painting the way I did yesterday is American. I'm a thrill seeker, like Americans. But I, I, I tell you that in a period like now when painting isn't particularly active or exciting, it enervates me. It makes me feel bad, too. I'm enough a part of my culture to want painting to be hot, to feel competitive in it, active in it, and to know that there's an appetite for it. The suburban landscape of America stretches from Long Island to Anaheim. It's familiar territory from TV, sitcoms and the movies. And in the 1980s, its inhabitants got their very own painter laureate, Eric Fischel. In the beginning, I think my paintings were generated from a lot of anger, focused on the place that I came from, and I did come from the suburbs. In uh, the environment in which I grew up in, there was not an ability to acknowledge what the reality was. Uh, everything was try, tried to be held into a, a, a set of acceptable images and, and, um, and they didn't often conform to what really was taking place. Poorly trained at art school, Fischl is a clumsy, uneven draftsman of the figure, but he finds images that seem to trail a whole narrative behind them. Memories of Edward Hopper's paintings of the 1930s underlie his work. He paints the middle classes not as lonely, but as positively deranged. His suburbs smell of hot vinyl, sperm, and barbecue fluid. Eric Fischel opens a peephole into a life that might just have been yours. The big source of America's cultural anxiety today is identity. You can't live here without getting a gutful of identity. If not your own, then other people's. America is in the business of inventing identities based on narrow conceptions of gender, race and the rest. These have made for narrow, preachy, single-issue art in which victim credentials count for more than aesthetic achievement. You get irritable agitprop, like this poster painting by Barbara Kruger, telling us that it's a small world, but not if you have to clean it. Or this neon piece rebuking the American government for not doing enough in AIDS research. All true, no doubt, but the fact that an artwork's about injustice no more gives it aesthetic status than the fact that it's about mermaids. This piece by Janine Anthony is about bulimia. She took a big lump of chocolate and gnawed at it like a beaver going at a tree. But so what? But the mother of American identity art is a French-born sculptor who came to the United States 50 years ago, Louise Bourgeois. This is very empty here. And... Uh... The emptiness here and the cleanliness is indispensable. 
It is the very opposite. It is the very opposite of the cluttered labyrinth that we have inside. Bourgeois sculpture is meant to make you uncomfortable. The works summon up experiences that come from deep within the body, the female body, exposure, protection, weak aggression, the body as totem, as cave, as lair. The source of bourgeois pain doesn't show, but it propels the images. Do you find that the, that the act of making sculpture is a way of mastering the fears which... Yes, absolutely. Made. The act of making a sculpture is, put, is to put order in discord, right? At any kind of level. Otherwise, the anxiety comes in. The chaos, the fear of chaos, that's it. <laughs>